and we are now recording. And with that, Dr. Claire, the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. So thank you very, very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for attending. Um, as Sal mentioned, uh, the topic tonight is the science behind COVID-19 and vaccines, just the facts. And I do want to give a special thank you to Sal and his staff over at the Port Jefferson Free Library. I really appreciate you hosting uh, this event tonight. And again, thank you all for joining. I have one disclaimer. Please note that the purpose of this presentation is for educational purposes and should not replace independent professional judgment or be used as a substitute for discussions with your healthcare professional. I have a very ambitious agenda tonight. Uh, since Sal was kind enough to read my bio, we will skip over that one. I do wanna review with you the history of pandemics, go directly into COVID-19, the virus itself, the variants which are now garnering a lot of attention in the scientific community as this coronavirus continues to mutate. And then I also wanna discuss with you the origin of the virus, where did it come from? Bacteria and viruses often leap from their host, whether it be an animal or typically an animal into humans. So I wanna tell you about how that happened with the uh, COVID-19 uh, disorder and disease. Uh, then we'll spend uh, the next part under the uh, topic of infection. This uh, COVID-19 and the novel coronavirus is extremely contagious. I wanna review with you why that's so and how that is occurring. Um, we also have been uh, typically had questions about uh, COVID-19 versus the flu, which is more deadly. Are they similar? What are the differences? So we'll review that. Go into a topic of the risk. Who's at risk? Why are they more at risk than others? And then you can't give a, a lecture or a presentation on COVID-19 without discussing the health disparities which have been uncovered and existed for years in our country uh, in African-American, Brown and Latino communities. And COVID-19 has really uncovered that. I wanna review that with you as well. And then we'll discuss the symptoms of COVID-19. We'll finalize with a bit on pathology, uh, vaccines. There's a new technology here, which has allowed the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine to get uh, available in record time without, I repeat, without um, uh, negating or in any way compromising safety, we'll review that. And then there are also treatments now available which are saving lives. Um, these treatments were not available at the beginning of the pandemic uh, in the spring of 2020 and even earlier than that. And then we'll finalize with FDA and the emergency use authorization process. Um, some are skeptical about the approval process. I want to allay your fears and discuss how this actually, how the vaccines actually got approved. And then we'll get into Q&A, as Sal mentioned at the end. Now, despite everything that we do know, we simply do not have all the answers to the questions which surround COVID-19. And there's another thing too, and that's that things keep on changing. This is a new disease. Coronaviruses have been around a long time. That's not new, but COVID-19 is brand new. And so we are finding out new aspects of the virus on a daily basis. And then they change as we get more and more information. This is just how it works when it comes to science. So you have to be patient and let the data speak for itself. Um, when you give a lecture like this, and you, as a scientist, it's often uh, been told to me that you're so buried in the facts and the figures and the numbers that you're actually forgetting the human cost. This is a tragedy, a catastrophe that has fallen onto humankind. And I in no way dismiss the events and deaths and the uh, fallout to the families that have been left behind. And I think Andrew Cuomo uh, said it best in March of 2020, 
my mother is not expendable. Your mother is not expendable. And our brothers and sisters are not expendable. And we're not going to accept the premise that human life is disposable. And we're not going to put a dollar figure on human life. The first order of business is to save lives, period, whatever it costs. As of this morning, over uh, 2.1 million people around the globe have lost their lives due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We cannot dismiss those lives. And in fact, I dedicate uh, this uh, presentation as all presentations that I do on this topic to the lives lost and the families that are suffering. As I said, um, Sal was kind enough to review aspects of my uh, bio and he hit all the uh, touch points that needed to be said. Thanks again, Sal. When, uh, when I put this presentation together, I did not rely on innuendo. I did not rely on the internet. I didn't go on to Instagram. I didn't listen to opinions. I put this presentation together based on scientific journals that I have grown up with. It's my job as a scientist to rely on the science. And this is just a partial list of the references that I referred to and, and used in creating the, pre the presentation that you're about to see this evening. I, when I put the presentation together, I was thinking about my father. My dad was born in 1918, the same year as the Spanish flu. And as you'll see on the very next slide, the Spanish flu was a, a pandemic that wiped out 50 to 100 million people around the globe. Um, it's not the first time, as you'll see in a moment. And by the way, it's not the last. What's interesting is my dad had to survive. He was just a baby, he was just an infant. His mother and dad survived it as well. So did his brother and his sister. I'm happy that he made it through, of course, because otherwise I wouldn't be here. But it really reminds us of, in the most simplistic of terms, uh, just how often history repeats itself. On the left of this slide is a timeline of pandemics that have plagued humankind for centuries. And on the right is the death toll. The Black Death or the bubonic plague, which occurred in 1347, cost 200 million lives. It started with uh, infected fleas that came from rats and then uh, crossed over into humans. The bubonic plague led to 30 to 50% of Europe's population being wiped out and it took more than 200 years for the continent's po uh, population to recover. In 1520, small smallpox caused by the variola virus um, occurred and it cost, led to 56 million deaths worldwide. And then came the Spanish flu in 1918. It lasted, some people say two years, some people say more. There were several different waves of the infection that swept through uh, the globe. The Spanish flu probably, it was uh, due to the H1N1 influenza virus, and it probably came from birds uh, who were the original origin. Um, the plague of Justinian caught, led to 30 to 50 million lives lost, and it is thought to have caused the demise and the actual fall of the Roman Empire. In 1981, to this day, we are dealing with the HIV AIDS epidemic, of course, caused by the HIV virus. Up to now, it's probably higher, but 25 to 35 million deaths as a result. And then finally, since 2019, we're now into 2021, we've got COVID-19 and the cost so far 
in terms of human lives is north of 2.1 million people. I put this slide up because I wanna show you the relative size of the uh, uh, coronavirus itself. And you can see on the left-hand side of this slide that in order to be uh, in, uh, taken into the lungs for inspiration uh, of air, a particle needs to be less than 10 microns small. You can see on the right, it's human hair, and then you can go down uh, the list here and see how big sand and salt is. But if you go all the way down here, you can see the novel coronavirus, which is 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 microns. That is more than enough smallness <laughs> to get into human lungs. And not only is, is that a factor of the infection, but it also reminds us of how, how easily this transmits through the air. And that is certainly one of the main ways that the novel coronavirus, the virus that causes COVID-19 is infecting our population around the world. It's not the first time. We were infected and we had a coronavirus scare in 2002 and 2003 of, of, of SARS severe acute respiratory syndrome. This started in Southeast China and the coronavirus was detected and there are many viruses that come from bats and this was no exception. So in uh, SARS, the coronavirus itself leaped from bats into civets. Civets are a, a cross between a cat and a mongoose. And from there, they, uh, that infection and the virus itself infected people. More than 8,000 people were infected, 774 people died around the globe, but there were no deaths in the US. And then in 2012, we had MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And this originated in the Middle East in Saudi Arabia. Again, a coronavirus held within bats. Bats are notorious for, uh, for um, uh, having, be, being actually carriers of uh, the coronavirus, many different types. And the same thing happened. Instead of jumping from bats, this time MERS jumped into camels. And camels then infected uh, two, almost 2,500 people who got infected more than 800 people died, and there are only two deaths in the US. So it does beg the question of if we've had these epidemics and these pandemics before, what happened in this case? Well, back in 2002 and 2012, the CDC and the WHO were in better communication and they were really able to detect it quickly. They were able to put a stop to it by um, imparting heavy, heavy quarantining in the countries that were infected. And that's how this virus, how SARS and MERS were squelched basically right at the beginning. No one's um, saying that the loss of 774 people or 858 is not an astoundingly catastrophic number. But when you think of the novel coronavirus and COVID-19, um, it's uh, obviously much, much smaller. So let's talk about COVID-19. It is a new disease. It's caused by, as I said, the coronavirus, but the coronavirus has been around for many, many years. In fact, the common cold is a coronavirus. So even though it's a new disease, we've known about coronaviruses for quite a long time. The thing that makes COVID-19 so mysterious is the fact that the symptoms range from mild, literally no symptoms, asymptomatic, to severe illness. And we also know, and I'll show you why, this illness can spread from humans to humans very, very easily. Now, the virus itself is officially called SARS-CoV-2, stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, which means that by definition, it is a respiratory illness. But we now know, and you'll see in a moment, that this disease can impact every single major organ system within your body. 
And that's why it is so uh, difficult to understand and also why fatalities are so high. Let's take a look at the uh, model of the novel coronavirus itself. Um, these viruses are actually, viruses themselves are the most abundant life form on, on Earth, uh, which many people find fascinating. Um, and they also don't really live. Viruses themselves don't, they, they have no respiration. So in fact, they're really not alive. They become alive when they infect a human body. The way they infect a human body is they enter it and then they enter a cell. Once they enter the cell, they live to do one thing and one thing only, to reproduce. Once they reproduce, they shed throughout your body and that's when you get into the different organ systems that are involved and every single one it is and that's how you get into trouble. I wanna highlight though the Corona, the corona or the crown of the virus. Coronavirus comes from corona, means crown. And you can see on the virus itself what are called spike proteins. These are these projections that are emanating from the virus. And it is these spike proteins that researchers are attacking in terms of these vaccines. If you can identify a way to prevent those spikes from developing, then you are in business because it's those spikes that grab onto the cell and enter it. Those spikes actually combine with a cell. They latch onto the cell via those spikes and that's how they get into uh, your cell and that's how they get into your uh, body. Uh, they get into your body, and then obviously move into the organs. So particular interest in that spike protein. And now the novel coronavirus that we knew and that was identified in early 2020, we now have important issues that are coming up in terms of uh, the uh, coronavirus variant. And this is deeply concerning. All viruses mutate. They mutate because they are trying to adapt. They want to live just like any other living thing on, on this earth. And we now have identified three different variants, one from the UK, one from Brazil, and one from South Africa. What makes these extremely interesting and worrisome is, are they more contagious than the original virus? and are they more lethal? So far, the scientific evidence is, indi is indicating that they in fact are more contagious. And I wanna to talk to you about that in a couple of minutes. In terms of lethality, we still, scientists and researchers still don't really know if it's more lethal than the original virus. But remember what I said at the beginning, this is an evolving situation. We don't have all the answers. As things develop, we'll get those answers. But for right now, this is something to keep an eye on and is something that scientists are aware of. So where did the uh, original virus come from? Well, we think that they originated in bats in Wuhan, China in an open air wet market. Wet market is where they sell fish and other uh, items like that. Um, the problem, though, is that on the particular day that a particular individual who was identified, this was in December of 2019, that day that person was in the Wuhan market, but they may not have been selling bats at the time of the outbreak. So suspicion has fallen on pangolins, which are scaly anteaters, as perhaps the initial source. So let's talk about how viruses leap from animals to humans. Making the leap from animals to humans is something that uh, we now have identified. And in the case of, of COVID-19, regardless of if the virus came from a bat or from the scaly anteater um, pangolin down below, we know that somehow it made its way into humans. This is not unusual. 
viruses leap from animals to humans uh, quite frequently. The reason that this is happening though is really because of humankind's encroachment into areas that have previously been unapproachable. As technology has improved and humankind always in its DNA, if you will, wants to explore, we are getting into environments that we've never um, been in before. And we've encountered these animals that in many cultures are delicacies. And so when we do that, we um, eat those animals and that's how the infection comes into human beings. Eating an animal in, itself, in and of itself is fairly safe as long as it's cooked, but it's the handling that comes before the eating, the killing of the animal, bat, pangolin, the skinning, the butchering, that is highly risky. And that's how these viruses jump from a bat or a pangolin in the case of COVID-19 into human beings. I'm off, often asked about COVID-19 versus the Spanish flu versus the seasonal flu. And it's all about something called the R naught number. The R number is essentially how a virus reproduces. And it's essentially its, its ability to spread. What you wanna do is have an R naught number that is less than one. Because what that means is that each person each person with an existing infection is causing less than one new infection. You can see up here, one person infects, if you have a, uh, an infection rate, an R of two, one person affects two, that person affects two more, and you can see how exponentially it can grow so quickly. So I put together this slide, which essentially looks at COVID-19 versus the Spanish flu versus the seasonal flu. And you can see the R number for COVID-19 is thought to be between two and three, but it could be as high as 5.7, especially with regard to these new variants. This is possible. This has been reported in some of the literature. You can see the Spanish flu had a R uh, naught rate, uh, number of 1.4 to 2.8, and the seasonal flu is the lowest with 1.3. If you look at the case fatality rate of COVID-19 versus these other flus, which is essentially a proportion of deaths to cases, you can see that COVID-19, we have a 2.1 uh, case fatality rate. The Spanish flu was over 2.5 and seasonal flu less than 0.1. That translates out to total deaths of COVID-19 at this point in 20, uh, 2021 of 2.1 million, the Spanish flu killed between 50 and 100 million people. And the seasonal flu typically kills 24,000 to 62,000. That's the death rate from last year. So clearly COVID-19 has the potential to be the most contagious of these viruses, while the Spanish flu seems to be the most lethal. Let's take an example of, of how a, an infection rate of 5.7 can grow exponentially. That would mean that 100 people infect 570 other people, just do the math. 570 infect 3,249. Those 3,249 then infect 18,519 other people, which you wind up with 100 people are originally infecting, and now your infections are in 3,429,576. So a R naught or infection rate, a contagiousness factor of 5.7 is just monumental in terms of this contagiousness. And this could explain why people are getting infected so easily. If you're not wearing a mask, if you're not social distancing, and if you're not washing your hands, this is why it's so susceptible. Here's the reason why COVID-19 is clearly very infectious. And even if it's two to three, just have the numbers. You can still see that the infection rate and the ability to infect the contagiousness is just so, so strong. 
Also, what about the similarities and differences between um, the flu? And we kind of just talked about some of the uh, specifics of death rate, um, infection rate, et cetera. But we do know that when it comes to uh, this comparison, what's common to both is really what you would expect with if you've ever had the flu. It's a respiratory illness. It comes with fe fever, cough, fatigue, typical body aches. It spreads pretty easily. And older adults, people with comorbidities and pregnant pregnancy put you more at risk. Influenza itself can cause mild to severe illness. Typically, you're, it takes about one to four days to develop symptoms. And young children can be at particularly a high risk of severe illness. Contrast that with COVID-19. Clearly, COVID-19, as you saw from the previous slide, spreads more easily. It's, we're having more super spreading events. Um, as you'll see, and I have another slide, it may take longer to develop symptoms and you're more contagious and you're more contagious for a longer time. This is why these people that are asymptomatic are still spreading the disease. And this is extremely problematic. They don't even know they have it and then they're spreading it. It can definitely cause more serious illness than the flu. We just um, talked about that and I'll show you another number. And in children in particular, there's something called the multi-system inflammatory syndrome disease, which I'll review in a minute. There's no doubt that the fatality rate of a person who gets COVID-19 is about six times greater than that of the seasonal flu. So who's most at risk and why is that? Well, there are really two vulnerable patient populations when it comes to COVID-19. The older patient population and those with underlying medical conditions. When you have underlying medical conditions, you are simply putting more of a burden on your body. And all of these matter in terms of being more vulnerable to COVID-19. It's almost as if COVID-19 seeks out your problem, your comorbidity, and then takes advantage of it. Heart disease, and I'm including people with hypertension in that category, makes you more vulnerable. Blood disorders, clearly lung disease, diabetes, cancer, chronic kidney disease, and obviously a weakened immune system. I highlighted obesity in men because obesity makes your immune system less strong. It weakens your immune system. That's been proven by scientific data. And unfortunately for us men out there listening in and anywhere else, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that versus women, our immune systems are less than that of women, probably due to metabolic and endocrine differences. Um, bottom line, our immune systems tend to weaken with age. And that's why as you are older, you are more susceptible to severe consequences of COVID-19. Quick note on the impact on children and something that I just mentioned about that severe inflammatory syndrome, similar to something known as Kawasaki disease, which is um, uh, a disease that uh, typically in infects uh, very young children. And in this case, what some people have been seeing uh, with COVID-19 is that children younger than five years old are developing this vasculitis, high fever, rash, hypotension, and GI symptoms. And you can see a picture of the vasculitis um, on the slide. The good news is that it's affecting these young children less than five years in a very small numbers, but it is still something uh, to be aware of. But that's not all. It's important that we look at athletes and people, uh, young uh, men and women who are not, uh, they're teenagers. They're essentially um, anywhere from 13 to 21. Uh, young athletes have been found uh, to have COVID-19 and develop heart complications. This, and it's due to um, some type of myocarditis or inflammation of the heart can be extremely serious. And we've also seen uh, COVID-19 related strokes in young individuals as well. So there's no doubt that young people, and I'll show you this in a minute, are less affected, but still 
they're, they're not only, they're not completely unaffected, they can have se severe consequences, and they very much are, are more likely than adults to infect other family members. We're not sure why, it might be that family members are gathering around their sick adolescents and trying to help and they're passing it along. But clearly, young people are more likely to spread uh, and infect other family members when they, in fact, become sick. Um, one of the things that I worry about most is that even though people with COVID-19, about 80% of them are developing mild or asymptomatic, uh, mild symptoms or they're completely asymptomatic, we still don't know what is yet to come in these individuals. You can recover, but we don't know what can happen down the line. So a lot of people are saying, you know, if I get infected, I'm 19 years old, what's the big deal? I'll have mild symptoms and I might not have anything. That's a misnomer because we don't know what will happen in your, uh, your, 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 in your 20s, in your th uh, 30s, your 40s, your 50s. We just don't have those answers. And that's why saying blowing off an infection as relatively mild is not the answer. We have to be thinking about down the line. Um, COVID-19 and racial disparities have really come to the forefront in terms of, uh, of what's happened. Um, this is a slide that highlights the fact that in African-Americans, they are getting infected and dire rates, which are more than 1.5 times their share of the population. And it's the same with Hispanics and Latinos. They are dying at rates, again, higher than their share of uh, the, of their uh, population. Um, why? Well, racial bias has existed in healthcare since day one. And COVID-19 has finally brought to the forefront of these inequities. Why? Why is there a racial bias in African-Americans, Brown and Latino communities? Well, in many cases, they don't have access to testing. They live in highly dense areas where there's multi-generational um, families living together that makes spread easier. They're exposed to often uh, pollution in urban uh, environments that makes them more susceptible to lung disease, to asthma, which is, which is definitely not what you want if you're dealing with COVID-19. Often because of the disparity in healthcare, they have a pre-existing condition. And also many African-Americans, uh, Brown and Latinos are essential workers. They are in the front line. When everyone else is, is huddling at home, the nurses, the doctors and the essential workers have been in the front line saving us. And again, a racial bias in healthcare has always been there. COVID-19 has dispelled any myth that this does not exist. What are the most common symptoms? Well, there are plenty of people who get no symptoms at all. They test positive, no symptoms. Mild can consist of typical fever, fatigue, aches, pains, sore throat, um, some cases, nausea, vomiting, et cetera. Moderate disease is pneumonia, but no obvious difficulty breathing. Severe cases come with pneumonia and inability to breathe. And then finally, the critical patients, the patients who are ending up in our hospital ICU units and often are intubated, have a complete breakdown of their body system, not only in the lungs, but also typically uh, in the brain, it can lead to shock, uh, heart, heart problems, um, clotting difficulties, and kidney impact as well. When are these most likely to occur? Well, for COVID-19, it takes about two to 14 days for incubation to occur. If you're going to get symptoms after you've been exposed, it's typically within five days on average. If you get the symptoms, it's gonna occur typically by day 12. And again, this is uh, on average. If you're infected, the spread typically occurs two to three days before symptoms start. And again, 
That's typically a major problem of why this is spreading so easily. And you're most contagious one to two days before you feel sick. Again, a problem of spread. The order that which these occur is typically first fever, then comes in the cough, then it's accompanied by sore throat, headache, and muscle pain, followed by nausea and vomiting, and finally diarrhea. So it really works itself through the body, almost starting from the upper part of your body and then descending uh, through, the, through headache and uh, different parts, but obviously working down into the um, GI tract. We are now, I checked this morning, we have almost 100 million global cases of COVID-19. There are very few, few places on the globe that have not had a case. And I highlight these two anecdotes to talk about the problem uh, more specifically. Here's someone who said to me, I had COVID back in February and my symptoms were so mild that I have to say, I take COVID over the flu, which made me really sick any day of the week. I read that a person with severe COVID-19 illness who was about to be intubated reportedly said to the nurses that were administering to him, I know this isn't COVID, it's just a bad case of the flu. This is a fallacy. Anyone who doesn't think that COVID-19 is serious is seriously misunderstanding or mischaracterizing what's going on. Um, I show this slide to, to really show how intense the infection can be. On the left are respiratory cilia that line, the lung, uh, line our lungs. And these are um, really almost like uh, flagella that are constantly moving these projectiles and they are constantly moving to bring particles, microbes and other debris that we inhale out of the lung into the trachea then to be spit out or to be swallowed where they, har they are harmless. But look at the slide on the right. This is from an electron microscope. And you can see the novel coronavirus, the virus that causes COVID-19, highlighted in red. And look at how infectious this disease can be. It's in, it, the infection is everywhere in the cilia. The cilia have no ability to get rid of this. These are going to enter the cells where they do their damage. There is no organ system unaffected by COVID-19. The lungs are the first order of business. This is a lung disorder by definition, which causes pneumonia. It can impact the brain and stroke seizures, inflammation of the brain and brain fog, being out of it, having cognitive problems, typical. The eyes can develop conjunctivitis and in severe cases, eyelid membrane inflammation. The nose can develop anosmia, which is um, in English, uh, simply the inability to smell. The virus attacks the nerve endings of the nose. It's often the way that they get into the body by being inhaled, obviously. And once it's inhaled, it does damage to those nerve endings in the nose and you no longer can smell. A heart and blood vessels, clots, heart attack, and, and inflammation of the heart, that myocarditis that I mentioned before, can occur and has been occurring. Both the liver and the kidneys are also being impacted. On the liver side, elevation of liver enzymes showing definitively liver damage. And then the kidneys having hypotension occurring. We're not sure if this is something that occurring upstream in the body, but certainly kidney damage um, is possible. And then finally, the intestines, which nausea, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. There is no organ system in the body that isn't impacted by COVID-19. Now, even though roughly 5% of the patients who become infected become critically ill, there are those patients that are experiencing long-term symptoms, and these are called the long haulers. And these are the complications that these folks are um, encountering. 
and you can see that it runs the gamut. It's extremely um, difficult to imagine months after you're testing, you've been negative, you, you tested positive and now you're negative. Can you imagine the unbearableness of being constantly fatigued, can't smell, having certain cardiac issues, not being able to breathe well, hair loss, vertigo. These are all long-term symptoms. And we uh, as scientists and researchers don't know how quickly they are going to, are going, going to go away. Um, people are experiencing some of these long-term symptoms for literally months after uh, they've tested, uh, tested negative. Um, I've kind of reviewed the death rate already of COVID-19, so I don't want to belabor this. When you do the math, we have it, and we showed this on a previous slide, globally, it translates out to a 2.1 global death rate and a 1.7 US death rate. And I think one of the misnomers or one of the mistakes that our young people are making is to think that it doesn't affect them. This is a death rate in the US taken uh, uh, in October of 2020. Ages one to 34, 4% of deaths are being reported. That's not zero, that's 4%. And it, double, and it doubles when you go from 35 to 54. It goes from 4% to 9%. So those people between 35 and 54 are also susceptible. And then clearly um, 55 to 85 and over are where the bulk of deaths are occurring for the reasons that we discussed um, a couple of slides ago. Their immune systems are weakened and they have often times have comorbid condition that makes them more susceptible. The whole idea here though, is to not dismiss it just because you're a young person. You can see that death can still occur in these uh, people. One of the problems with COVID-19 is why does the illness affect people so differently? Why are some cases mild, barely noticeable, while others end up in the ICU unit? And really, unfortunately, at this time, we're not completely sure, but there are some theories. One of them is that because of genetics, we actually develop antibodies that work against us. There's also the possibility of a cytokine storm, which is essentially your body's immune system running amok. Cytokines are proteins that help clean up an infection. Sometimes there's such a hyperactivity of it that they actually work against you and cause dramatic inflammation. So you were initially infected by COVID-19, but you actually are severely compromised and even die due to this intense inflammation, especially in the lungs due to the cytokine storm. And really, the reason is genetics. We just don't know that much about it. At the end of the day, there are some peoples whose immune system are just less able to fight the virus besides the elderly, uh, um, besides the elderly. Um, so there are some younger people that have this going on, and that's why some of the, the young uh, population have had severe infections. Let's get into the vaccines. Human coronavirus have been around for decades. We know about them. They are the cause of the common cold. Um, scientists have been studying coronaviruses, as I said, for years, especially with SARS and MERS. And it was really the MERS experience that began the development of the COVID-19 vaccine. So I wanna take you through Pfizer's overall development program, because a lot of people are saying the vaccine got on the market so quickly, I'm not sure about it. Well, first of all, coronavirus has been around for a long time. This is not when the development of the vaccine started. It started decades ago. In the early 2020, Pfizer had already identified the genetic sequence of COVID-19 and they started to do animal studies. When you know the genetic sequence, you can develop a drug to try and highlight a weakness in that system. 
And that's where that spike protein comes in, more on that in a minute. At the same time, Pfizer started to advance their manufacturing. They took a chance and started to develop a vaccine at the earliest possible onset. And they went from developing it all the way up into large scale production. This then led them into phase one, which is early clinical trials and pivotal phase two and three studies where tens of thousands of people were tested with the vaccine. They started to, and highlighting the pivotal phase two and three study. At the same time, the DSMB got involved, Data Safety Monitoring Board to monitor safety. And this led to all types of follow-up safety data. Even today, they continue to follow these patients that were in the clinical trial. Pfizer enrolled in their clinical program approximately 44,000 patients and Moderna had 30,000 plus patients in their clinical trial. The data speaks for itself, 90% effective. It's been uh, published in peer reviewed journals as has uh, for not only Pfizer, but also Moderna's uh, vaccine as well. 90 to 95% effective is unbelievable when you consider that in order to get a flu vaccine approved, all you need is 50% efficacy. So this is unparalleled. And it really has to do with the new messenger RNA technology. It's great. It's shown that it's great, great, has greater effectiveness, clearly shown safety advantages, and it's actually easier to manufacture. That's led to these COVID-19 vaccines that are now approved for Pfizer and to Moderna to be allowed for use via emergency use authorization. And the good news is that AstraZeneca is right around the corner. But if you're in line for the, for the COVID-19 uh, COVID vaccine, make sure that you consult with your doctor before you get it. Why? Because in some individuals, you can develop severe reactions known as anaphylaxis. This is a complete collapse of the cardiovascular system. You wanna be able to assess your risk with your doctor. And then if you get the vaccine and you've had this in your past, you wanna be monitored for 15 minutes post uh, injection. Quickly, let's go through vaccines themselves. Um, with a vaccine, you're given a small amount of the actual harmless form of the disease itself. And this is kind of mimicking the immune system. So you're vaccinated. Your body then develops antibodies to fight off the disease. And you then, when confronted with the virus itself, you have those antibodies and your body is able to give you immunity it fights it off. Those antibodies are there. There are different types. There's live attenuated, which is live but weakened. The uh, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine is like that. Inactivated, which is the killed version of the virus, such as the flu and the polio vaccine. And at the end of the day, what do they do? They mimic the virus to activate the immune system. You're developing antibodies without being infected. So what about messenger RNA vaccines? Well, we know the genetic code for COVID-19, as you saw on my previous slide. We know the DNA sequencing of that. That led, uh, that led scientists at Pfizer and Moderna to understand the messenger RNA sequence, which is essentially instructions for cells to make a piece of that spike protein. They wanted to develop antibodies to the spike protein because they knew if they, could if they could inhibit that spike, that the spike would be unable, the virus itself would be unable to infect individuals. So what do messenger RNA vaccines do? They create a message to the body to manufacture antibodies specifically against the virus spike. That means that when you encounter the virus itself, you have those antibodies as I showed you before, and you are protected. Another way to look at it, messenger RNA vaccines neutralize the virus by inhibiting those spike proteins to ever develop. They have no way to hook onto cells and they're neutralized. Messenger RNA vaccines have been studied for a long time. 
They do not contain a live virus. So you have no risk of, of carrying or getting uh, the disease itself. Messenger RNA from the vaccine never enters the nucleus of the cell. It does not affect or interact in any way with a person's DNA. People are asking, is my are my genes being affected from this messenger RNA? It's not. Well, from the messenger RNA vaccine, it's not. It's got nothing to do with a person's DNA. It's interacting and inhibiting the spike protein of the novel coronavirus, period. Real quick, if you take a look at the actual clinical trial on the horizontal axis down below is the uh, days after a person got vaccinated. And this was a double blind placebo controlled study. So some people got the vaccine and others got the placebo. On the X axis is the days after the first dose. And on the um, vertical axis is the cumul cumulative incidence of COVID um, infections. You can see that everything is normal until about day 14, where these two groups started to, uh, to, started to um, uh, separate. What it means is that the vaccine may start safeguarding patients at about day 14 after dose one. So the point is, be careful about after you get your vaccine uh, and getting that first dose to run around without a mask or get into crowds thinking that you're immune. Immunity will take time to develop. And importantly, you need the second dose. You must get the booster for both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. Even after you get vaccinated, you're gonna still have to wear a mask because even though studies have shown the, vaccine, the vaccines prevent a person from getting the symptoms of COVID-19, they do not, um, we do not know if, you can, if you'll pass along the virus. You could still be infected, you won't get the symptoms because you're vaccinated, but you could still pass the virus on to others. Uh, it would likely be at a lower rate, but it could still happen. So you have to wear a mask. Immunity, we're just not sure, but we think the immunity is probably around one year once you get the COVID-19 vaccine. And again, uh, the data will, uh, will let us know. We're still not absolutely sure. I wanna take us through real, at the end here, remdesivir as one of the major treatments that are now being used to save lives. This was the first FDA approval, but what's important is that it does not reduce mortality. It's found to shorten the recovery time in hospitalized patients, but it is an important modality. It's an antiviral, and it's very, very important to know about these medicines. Dexamethasone, interestingly, is a drug that was discovered and approved back in the 1950s. It's an anti-inflammatory, it's a steroid, and it's the only drug to date found to reduce mortality. And then monoclonal antibodies are definitely at the forefront for saving people's lives. How do we know that? Well, this was President Trump's treatment when he went into the hospital when he was infected. You can see that he took dexamethasone, as I just mentioned, to prevent that cytokine storm. Remdesivir that I just mentioned, the antiviral, which prevents viruses from replicating. And then also the monoclonal antibody which is essentially synthetic versions of antibodies. The rest were vitamins that um, could, be, could have some impact on immunity, uh, bone health, uh, uh, heartburn, uh, insomnia, and aspirin to reduce the risk of blood clotting, but they really have nothing to do with uh, having any, any impact on COVID-19. We think that we can start to get a, a pretty good idea about who's gonna have a bad outcome or who's gonna have a good outcome. We know that blood type may play a, a feature. If you have type O, it seems like those people based on research are having a better outcome than people with type A blood. A seems to be make you more susceptible to a, a particularly um, damaging uh, pneumonia, uh, type O. Uh, seems to uh, not be having a, a, a bad outcome. More research needs to be done on that. I know there's some skepticism around FDA, but let me assure you that the FDA was not only involved in the approval of the vaccines, the advisory committee process provides a way 
for independent experts to weigh in on the data. And these consist of scientific experts, physicians, medical people, statisticians, chemists, biologists, and others, as well as consumers, not only uh, consumers from the public, everyone gets a say at the advisory committee process. And then they vote on key issues and they provide their recommendation to FDA. In the case of uh, Moderna and um, Pfizer, it was overwhelmingly supportive. They make a recommendation to FDA and 99% of the time that recommendation is accepted by FDA. And another thing, Governor Cuomo made sure that New York State had their own COVID-19 clinical advisory task force read the same data and they too uh, weighed in with a positive uh, response with regard to the data to support not only the efficacy of the vaccine, but also the safety. We're at a uh, very unusual time in our history. The COVID-19 pandemic represents the greatest public health crisis of this generation and potentially since the pandemic influenza outbreak of, of, of 1918. But I think we can rise to the occasion because as Madame Curie said, who is really the forefather of radioactivity and also a physicist and chemist, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may, may fear less. Thank you so much for your kind attention. And Sal, I know I ran pretty long here, but hopefully people can stick around and uh, if they have any questions, I'm more than happy to uh, entertain them. Fantastic, not a problem. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm gonna actually stop the recording now.